I'll go first. Uh, thanks, thanks for having me. Happy to be here and uh, share a little bit about uh, what and our understanding, I guess, and points of view about blockchain. Hope you can see my presentation. Let me put it in presentation mode. It should be better. All right. Now, I named the short uh, talk or introduction, I would say, that blockchain is much more than cryptocurrency. Uh, this word oftentimes is used interchangeably. And indeed, cryptocurrency maybe are the most or the biggest use that use of uh, the blockchain technology. Nevertheless, the blockchain, the, the blockchain technology has much wider usage and scope, certainly in uh, enterprise scenarios where it's much less known. And uh, it's not necessarily that in the future the things will remain the, in the same status quo as it is today, meaning that we might see many more applications that take advantage um, of blockchain, blockchain technology. Now, just a quick background. I'm from IBM Research. Uh, as many of you know, IBM Research, somewhere around 3,000 researchers spread worldwide. I'm located in Israel, in the Haifa, in the city in the north. Um, as you know, many awards that IBM Research won. I would say that we are more, if there is one big change that happened in IBM Research, that we are much more close to our clients, to the industry working in the, in the field. And in Israel, we are working across all the disciplines, and we have, a, would say, a strong heritage to, to do innovation, but what we call innovation that matters, matters to our clients, to society, and some things are longer term, but a lot of things are medium term, I would say. And obviously, we partner and collaborate a lot with academia and, and so on. So uh, with that short introduction, back to, okay, what, what problem does blockchain solve? So inherently, today, when we are building distributed system, or in a sense, we have enterprises that want to coll collaborate one with another whether it's uh, to have some uh, marketplace, transfer goods, do some supply chain, so on and so forth. In most cases, it is a bilateral relationship. Sometimes it's a little bit more complex, but essentially each and every organization keeps a ledger with the transaction it performs. And if I transfer uh, money to an enterprise or one enterprise to another, each of them registers the transaction. The problem is that in most cases this works and there is no problem, but when there is a problem and manual intervention is needed, it is very, very costly. And then you have to find where that problem was and until reconciliation happens, it's a long, long journey and very, very costly. So it's in that sense, it's inefficient, expensive, vulnerable to attacks, so on and so forth. Before I move on to talk about blockchain, there is, in general, and as I said, there is a lot of, uh, I would say, um, uh, not, not well distinction, I would say, between cryptocurrency and, and blockchain. And that primarily refers to what we call permissionless networks, public networks, such as Bitcoin and many others. These networks typically are completely open. That's why we call them permissionless in the sense that anyone can join the network evaluate transactions, participate, run transactions, validate transactions, execute them, um, get some incentive to do, to do so. And of course, clients can use the network to, um, to run transactions uh, uh, and, and so on, if it is transfer of uh, ownership of, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, one other phenomenon is that in most cases, the participants are anonymous. They don't have to register with their IDs or anything like that. And that's why we do see a lot of cases of fraud, cases of ransom and, and, and other things. On the other hand, the permission blockchain that's more of interest to corporations, large enterprises, is private, meaning that we set up these networks in a controlled environment where we know who is the participants in the network, who are those who uh, run transactions and validate transactions and because these are, are our partners who we do business with uh, so we can authenticate them and then of course the consensus algorithms those that decide the order of transactions so on and so forth are much much more efficient compared to the permission 
permissionless uh, uh, networks. Um, so as I was saying, one of the main things that blockchain brings to these use cases in the enterprise, I would say, is trust. So there are these enterprises that collaborate among themselves. And as I said, uh, they want to do some transfer of, of, of ownership, transfer of money, whatever it is. Um, the way that they gain this trust from this technology is by creating much more transparency because everyone in the network, because these are my partners who I transact with, and I authenticate them, I know who they are, they can see the transactions that relate to them. So there is no multiple ledgers. It's one single ledger that each and every one has a copy of. And everyone can validate who signed that transaction. And there is no doubt that that transaction actually happened. So that creates a lot of um, trust in the system. Uh, and of course, it uh, in improves resiliency and creates a lot of opportunities for uh, automating many manual processes. Um, what are the things we can use it for? Obviously, it, we, we oftentimes hear, and you, I'm sure you hear the terms like NFTs, non-fungible tokens. In general, tokens is just a term or an abstraction we use. The, to, you can think of it as the digital representation of something of value we want to trade or something of value we want to transfer ownership and things like that. It could be things that are tangible, like a house, a, a car, whatever. It could be intangible assets, financial assets, right? Those are very popular in the crypto world. Uh, it could be also a patent or, or whatever it is. So there are tangible and intangible, essentially anything of value that we want to uh, exchange uh, ownership or has some value could be abstracted in that way. Now, if I move on, when you hear about NFTs, I'm sure you've heard a lot. Um, I do want to draw just attention to just a few things. Um, those who watch the space may have seen that uh, you know, there was this image on the right that was sold for many hundreds of millions of dollars. And just as uh, uh, in comparison to one of the big uh, true uh, art by Leonardo da Vinci, which was sold for less, for 475. So one may ask immediately, how come this drawing on the right was paid so much money? And here is the many faults and many issues and concerns uh, that there are with NFTs. Most probably no one paid for that, uh, drawing so much money. Yes, there are people who paid maybe a million dollars for a drawing uh, like the apes, the bored apes and things like that, but not 500 million. Most probably what happened here is that someone had multiple wallets, anonymous wallets. He transferred this um and sold this uh, picture to himself essentially moved it and essentially he paid himself or just transferred cryptocurrency he had and by that he tried to show that the the value of this uh, nft is raising reality is that it's really just uh, a fraud where he transferred its uh, ownership among himself now just quickly because we don't have that much time i do want to draw the attention that there are multiple issues um, in this whole space around cryptocurrency, Web3, and of course, many of you have read the recent news, and there is a mix of things. There are things that happen because the domain is unregulated, certainly DeFi, the decentralized finance. So things that like the, what happened with FTX, but then there are also a lot of vulnerabilities in these systems because they're not tested enough in some cases and exploiters take advantage and very quickly can steal huge amounts of money. Sometimes because these tokens are tracked, they cannot always uh, spend them if, unless they do that very quickly. Uh, but nevertheless, in 2022, about $4 billion were stolen. Uh, so that's, that's a, still a way to go for, for this uh, industry. So I think one of the issues, for instance, with permissionless system is the lack of governance. Or there exists a governance, only that it is extremely decentralized and it's extremely hard to actually make a change in a system. 
because the governance, as I said, is kind of open-ended. Everyone can join the network and you need to reach consensus from everyone to, to, to make any change. There are more uh, vulnerabilities, but just to say one last word around NFTs, NFTs essentially, in many cases, what people buy and they don't really even understand it, it's just the proof of ownership of some asset. Oftentimes that asset, if it's a drawing or so, doesn't even reside on the blockchain. So it's not in the ledger. It's somewhere on a website that may go down one day. And yes, he may still remain with a receipt in his hands, but it won't be of a lot of value to him. Um, one of the other issues that we see some of these fa failures and people losing huge amounts of money, while there is a belief that the systems are decentralized, and indeed the systems can be built in a decentralized manner, still, at least in the permissionless and certainly in the cryptocurrency world, a lot of the services like wallets and development environments are still centralized by single organizations. Yes, they do transactions eventually on, let's say, Ethereum, which runs in a decentralized manner, and by that gives more resiliency. But the fact that your wallet with all your cryptocurrencies hosted by a single service provider, and if that company goes bankruptcy, you lose your money, it's still a problem, in a, certainly when it's unregulated. So one of the major changes that are taking place, and I'll wrap up in a minute, is you've heard a lot around CBDC, Central Bank Digital Currency. That's partially the answer of governments to regulate things and come up with digital currency, many of which will be implemented because blockchain is a natural fit um, to, to, to support these kind of uh, use cases. And I'll end up with just one more chart. I talked about permissionless systems and private systems. And there is a third uh, way to think about building these kind of systems, which is permission yet open systems that provide, I would say, the benefits of both of these. All of the guarantees that you have in private networks with good ways for collaboration. And I'll stop here to give more time for the others. Thank you and happy to chat. Uh, later. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Dodik. Uh, now we're going to give the floor to uh, Professor uh, Boyton. You are muted, I think. Yes. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So, uh, thank you very much for the ex excellent introduction, uh, Gabi, on, 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 on blockchain and uh, uh, touching maybe a little bit on, on cryptocurrency. Um, I'm, I'm a, a, a technical computer scientist by trade with, a, with a, a good interest in social impact of computing these days and um, also, also an interest in, in bringing realism into the discussion. So, from from my point of view, um, the the most essential the most essential slide that that Gabi was showing was the, was the one was the one with all the issues in it. Most of the most of the things that I, I would have wanted to mention uh, came up in there. I think I think at the moment we're we're looking at a at a um, a triangle of three things which all have all have their problems but all depend on each other. So one of one of them is blockchain, and um, I think I think in Gabi's uh, um, presentation the emphasis was initially on on permission blockchains. But of course, when we talk about the the cryptocurrency world, when we talk about the NFT world, that relies way more on the uh, permissionless uh, blockchain, which which is the area with the bigger problems. So it, that's that's the area where we have. Uh, Systems like Bitcoin, which essentially can't process uh, enough transactions to be a realistic al alternative for anything. Um, we, we have in, in that world, um, the Bitcoin blockchain, which is an ecological disaster and which remains an ecological disaster. Uh, so it, we, that respect needs, needs switching off, switching off urgently. Um, but let me give let me give a slightly different perspective on it. Looking looking at Web 3.0 as a starting point. So Web 3.0 is the so-called new version of the web, in which uh, users own their own data and 
uh, through all sorts of uh, games of, of uh, trickery. Um, so all relating to um, micro incentives uh, and uh, associated with cryptocurrency and data being on the blockchain. Um, the idea is that users get incentivized that way to participate in, in novel services. So um, while, while you can look at that from different angles, the, the angle I want to emphasize for a moment is the angle of uh, users owning their own data. Um, from from my, my privacy background, um, users owning data is, is, just, is just a very difficult paradigm. Data, data does not, data is not something that we should talk about in terms of in terms of owning. Data is, and data can be copied freely, and um, quite often, quite often there are multiple parties involved for data. Even in the in the simple case, in the simple case of uh, medical data about a person, the data already associates with the patient, but it may also associate with the doctor involved. It may also associate with others. Uh, extreme case of genomic data. Uh, it may be genomic data about you, but it gives an awful lot of information away about, about your, um, your family as well. So to, to take that as, as uh, on, the other, on, on the other side, uh, you could look at at people holding databases of data as as owning it as well, and neither of neither of those is a perfect reflection of owning, uh, and as a consequence, it doesn't it, it it is not a productive paradigm to to think about people owning their data or, uh, or selling their data. Um, this this extends actually into into human rights dimension. Um, the human rights view of data, of personal data, is that people have rights over that data and they're inalienable rights, if you like. So they are not rights that can be subject to a financial transaction that can disappear through a financial. Dis uh, uh, so, so, yeah, you can't, you can't give away the ownership of your personal data. Um, you could monetize it maybe in little, little sense, but Treating it, treating it as, as, as a possession is, is, is problematic for, for a number of the reasons that I've given now. So that's, that's, um, that's web, the, the main thing that, in my view, undermines Web 3.0 and any, any, any world in which we think that the data should go back to the people. Blockchains have, the, have their own issues other than the ecological ones. In most applications, in most applications where um, uh, a permissioned blockchain is used, the case the case for making um, the case for not making it as some kind of distributed database is fairly thin. Do we really need all all the all the machinery of the uh, of, of of the consensus algorithm, etc.? The, the 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 line that a uh, permissioned system runs in a trust uh, an environment of non-trusting partners is sort of undermined by the idea that you need to give people access to that blockchain that is that is quite powerful in the first place. So, yeah, that 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 is that is that is one one area where I have some worries. Um, if we talk about permission blockchain permissionless blockchains. Um, from the security card part, I also have some additional worries. Uh, for example, by the um, the data not being mutable and the data not being deletable that ends up on that blockchain. So even while it's protected by powerful encryption now, uh, we don't we don't know for sure whether the powerful encryption that we use there now to produce some level of anonymity, uh, some level of security. Uh, is is indeed still as powerful into the future so that that means that any information any information that uh, by rights should be protected forever or any information that by rights should be allowed to disappear forever for example because it's it's uh, uh, well pro problematic information of any kind that you might want to delete uh, is is not in the position in not a position of ever being put on the blockchain responsibly. Uh, so we 
the solutions that are here to that are usually uh, blockchains on top of tops of blockchains and uh, systems on top of systems, but they never they never fully get away from from the uh, fundamental problems. Uh, the, 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 of the of the data not being not being mutable and not being protected forever. Finally, from my cybersecurity perspective, I have a, a big worry about uh, the blockchain cryptocurrency combination also being a big enabler of ransomware. Uh, I imagine that if we didn't have uh, cryptocurrencies, if we didn't have cryptocurrencies living on the on the blockchain. Uh, Ransomware criminals would find ways of getting paid that would give them levels of levels of anonymity, uh, levels of security. But for the moment, it just makes it it just makes it too easy from my perspective. So those are those are just a, a, a few a few thoughts uh, why why I think that the situation we're we're currently in with with existing cryptocurrencies living on the existing blockchains is highly problematic and uh, why i think that the the the, the ideal of of web 3.0 is probably a bit that that relies crucially on those two is is probably a bit overblown and problematic thank you thank you very much uh, professor boyden now let's hear from uh, the economists and on the panel rafael Hello, everyone. Um, thank you, Ibrahim. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you to the school for organizing this panel. Um, I will share my screen. Uh, screen. Uh, okay, so what I wanted to do today is show you an example of an interesting new application that's happening in blockchain and try to think about what is the potential of this, but what are the dangers, right? And, and try to give a balanced assessment. And so um, here I'm interested to tell you about this new form of market making, which is happening in, um, in the so-called DeFi, decentralized finance landscape. And I wanna ask this question of, is this way of providing liquidity sustainable? Um, so first, you know, we'll look at briefly what are these uh, this, what is this new form of market making? It's called automated market makers, AMMs. How do they work? How do they compare to a traditional dealer? And you know, try to reflect on 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 um, whether this decentralized liquidity provisioning is sustainable. So, market making in traditional finance. So, when you study economics one hundred and one, right, you learn about supply and demand the two curves and they intersect, uh, right? And it, price formation is easy. Um, it's just the intersection of the two curves. But in real markets, it's a much more complicated story and liquidity is provided by these intermediaries. We call them market makers or dealers. And they're basically standing willing to buy or sell any security. And of course, buying at a price which is lower than the price at which they're selling. And that's the so-called so -called bid ask spread. And bid ask is dynamic. Um, and what you'll see is when markets are not very liquid, the bid ask increases. So the price is not deterministic. Um, and this bid ask spread is a source of profit making for, uh, for finance. Now, blockchain technology is powering a new kind of market making, and the way that it works is, is radically different. You have instead so-called liquidity providers, which can be anyone contributing digital assets to a liquidity pool. The assets are locked up in the smart contract, and anybody who wants to trade, uh, you don't need to be matched with a counterpart. The pool itself is the counterpart and in essence provide liquidity to the market by taking whatever position the trader needs. Um, and the, but the pricing is deterministic. So that's one big difference. So the big name, if you're not familiar with it, is Uniswap, um, which is a so-called constant product AMM for a spot trading. So the, the big idea I wanna get across here is that AMMs are part of this nascent DeFi ecosystem. There are these algorithms, they provide liquidity in, in electronic markets. 
and this whole architecture of decentralized exchanges that are relying on AMMs is being built right now. And um, they are marketplaces that are facilitated, right, through smart contracts, and they, they are non-custodian. So um, the uh, no one is actually uh, intermediating. There's no balance sheet, right? It's all peer-to-peer -peer via the pool. The way that Uniswap works is interesting, is the product of two assets in the reserves are equal to a constant, and this is how um, prices are maintained. So the mechanism, just so that people have a sense how this works, um, if you are a liquidity provider here on the left, you come in and you can put two tokens in the pool, um, say X and Y, you know, this could be Bitcoin and US and a stable coin, for example. And in exchange, um, they get you get a token, which is a pool token, which represents your ownership in, 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 in this pool. And then if you're a trader, you come in and you're basically going to add one token. Let's say you're, you're looking to sell Bitcoin. You're going to add some Bitcoin to the Bitcoin reserve and you're going to withdraw some stable coin from the stable coin reserve. And the, the ratio between the two is the price. Um, so this is if you're selling or if you're buying. Now, <clears throat> some example, you can see you know, a screenshot from the website, what this looks like. You see these pools, you always have two assets in the pool. And what you see here, like the percentage is, is the trading fee. So the way that um, these market makers get compensated is by charging a percentage of every trade. Um, and that's the trading fee. So pricing, there's a lot on this slide. And obviously we're not really go going through this math, but what I wanna say here is that the, the pricing and the reserves are constantly rebalancing and constantly changing as traders arrive and, and trade. The marginal price is the relative size of the reserves in the pool, but that's for the marginal price. So a very, very small order. Um, when you have a, a real order, the, the price impact is going to depend on the size of the order. A larger order will have more of a price impact. The price will change, right? Relative to the marginal price. Um, than, a, than a small order. And the tokens get more expensive as orders get larger. And so the idea here is that the removal of liquidity, completely complete removal of liquidity is impossible as long as the, there are token reserves in the pool. Um, if, if one trader wants to buy a very large amount, right, it's just going to be a lot more expensive for them and they're going to get a lot less um, of the token, right? The other thing that's interesting here is that there's no bid-ask spread. So remember I told you that the traditional market maker is charging a different price depending on whether people wanna buy or sell. And here there's no bid-ask. Um, really the only compensation to the pool is supposedly the trading fees. Um, but that doesn't mean that the price when you're buying is exactly the same as the price when you're selling. That's a little confusing. But it just means that if you have two traders and what they were doing were basically off, offsetting each other, there's no one profiting from this, whereas a market maker is always profiting from, from trades via the bid ask. So here instead, right, you, you have trade price if you're buying or if you're selling. I just want to show that there's different agents who are capturing value here. The network is charging gas fees. Um, the, the, you have trading fees, right, that traders pay to the pool. Um, and then you also have a so-called price impact or LP capture, which is the idea that the price changed um, resulting from the trade as a result of the, the reserves changing in size. And so that's also going to affect the value that's in the pool. Okay, so how is this different from traditional market maker? You know, one interesting idea here is the idea of on-chain price discovery, um, right? Via this AMM, all the information is on-chain and that's supposed to make this informational playing field pretty equal because everybody has access to this in real time. Uh, in traditional finance, the market makers, they pay subscriptions for data in order to have uh, visibility into the order flow, right? And this is something that you pay for. Um, but here, not so. 
The other potential benefit here is to minimize negative selection for liquidity takers. So if you come in and as a trader, you wanna buy something, uh, the price is, is set by an algorithm. You don't have to deal with the market maker who's trying to execute um, if, it's, if it's always not in your favor. So that's one of the problems in traditional finance is market makers have the ability to cancel at the last minute and basically execute limit orders only when it's when the when when they know that the market is moving in in the direction that's advantageous for them so that's another benefit and you also have to think about price and whether price is stable or not and you know here uh, as i explained to you it has to do with the size of the pool in traditional markets it has to do with the volume and you know it could be that if the size of the pool is large enough that that makes um, the ability of large orders to impact price, like it reduces it, makes it more difficult for, for, for people to come in and manipulate the price. All right, I'm gonna to try to move a little faster. Um, it, it's unclear yet that really this goal of on-chain price discovery is actually happening. And in fact, there's lots of reason to believe that price discovery is still happening off chain. And part of it has to do with the, the speed of the blockchain. Um, if it's too slow, what you find is that price discovery is still happening on centralized exchanges and constant product AMMs like Uniswap is mostly arbitrage. Uh, basically people trading to move the price in line with the fair value on centralized exchanges, which defeats a little bit the purpose of, of on-chain price discovery. Um, so even though the, the method here for market making is very different, you know, one, the traditional model, only sophisticated financial intermediaries provide liquidity here. Anybody can be an LP and provide liquidity. You can still find uh, lots of similarities. You, you can think about the profit and the risk to market making, and you'll, you'll find that, you know, um, they're relatively similar. Um, you don't have a bid ask spread. You have trading fees in terms of risk. You know you have the risk of the value of, of the inventory potentially fluctuating. It's called inventory risk for traditional dealers, um, and you have the potential of um, negative selection, which is called pickoff risk. Risk, which is the idea that as a dealer, you you always worry that people know more than you and are basically buying and selling from you. Um, at a price which is not in in your in your advantage, but you can re rediscover the same categories with LPs. Um, now, it, instead of inventory risk, you have something known as impermanent loss. And impermanent loss is the idea that, um, and we won't go through all the math, but I left it in there in case I wanted to share the slides and people could refer to it. But the idea that uh, when the, the price of tokens changes, of the two tokens that are in the pool changes, whether one token becomes more, more expensive or less expensive relative to the other, that can lead to some losses for the LP in that the LP would have been better off by not putting any tokens in the pool in the first place. Um, when you do the math and you go through the computation, you find out that, hey, would have been better to not even have my money, my tokens tied up in the pool. Um, so price fluctuation is not good for liquidity providers. What you want is really a price that's pretty stable. Um, the other thing to think about is the balance sheet, right? What's happening with the blockchain is that the full balance sheet is, is put on fully on chain and it's a pretty flat balance sheet. So if you look at the bottom, I'm showing you different pools. What is in the pool is two assets. And then basically you have all the LPs who own a share of that pool and that's it. Um, and that's a very different model than the traditional model where you have different market makers with different inventories of all sorts of different assets and then financing themselves with a mix of debt and equity. So completely different uh, balance sheet structure. So, you know, are we really rethinking market making? We have different terminology, but arguably we have the same sources of risk, right? What happens when there's high asset volatility? Well, for traditional dealers, you have inventory risk. For LPs, you have impermanent loss. What happens when there's adverse selection? Well, for traditional market makers, there's pickoff risk. And for LPs, there's you know, toxic flow. Um, so 
um, it's the same, you know, you're rediscovering the same problems of traditional finance. And the big difference here is that the LPs are more passive. They have less control than traditional market makers, right? They don't get to adjust their bid ask spread. The price is deterministic and basically they can just put in their money in the pool and everyone who does so at the same time is subject to the same risk return profile. So the timing of when you deposit in a pool becomes the key differentiator between different LPs. Now, most LPs are passive, but there are still a few LPs who are actually active who come in at very specific moments in time. And so this is where I wanna start concluding in showing you some issues of, of this model for liquidity provision. And one issue is that it seems that the it's not that attractive to be an LP. Um, so it doesn't seem like the liquidity is being priced properly. So there's some reasons to think that LPs are not really rewarded enough. Um, there are different studies out there. I don't know that I want to spend a ton of time, but this one is interesting. Um, it, it, it analyzed, <clears throat> so this study was done in, um, I think a couple of years ago, and they analyzed 17 pools um, covering 43% of the value locked in Uniswap. And they found that for most of the pools, the um, impermanent loss was greater than the fees, than the trading fees, right? So there's actually no real reason to invest as an LP, uh, with the exception of a small subset of LPs, the so-called flash LPs who, you know, only provide liquidity during one block. Um, this is so-called just-in-time liquidity, right? So they know something that the, the rest of the market doesn't know. And they come in at a very specific moment and they're able to avoid impermanent loss and uh, charge fees. But for the rest of LPs, it wasn't very clear that it was profitable. There's also different um, attempts to, to measure uh, toxic flow, which is the idea that the pool is always charging a price which is not quite the right price, right? And is always selling for a little bit less than, than the fair value and buying for a little bit more. Um, so you can use this methodology of mark out, which is to try to compute um, the, the return had the pool uh, reversed, uh, very quickly reversed any, any trade that it did on an exchange. And you find that when you, when you look at this, that a lot of the liquidity pools are actually losing money relative to the pricing on centralized exchanges. So um, to wrap up, right? The, these are just preliminary results and these, these are not peer reviewed uh, um, articles or anything, but I think they warrant further consideration, even though we can have some debates, some methodological debates about how to compute profits for LPs and so forth. Um, you know, is it true that liquidity is 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 underpriced, and and it, does this have to do with the fact that trading fees are static as opposed to dynamic, right? A traditional dealer in in finance, the bid ask is dynamic. Um, here, the trading fees are not. Is the issue with very concept of deterministic pricing that that allows the pools to be taken advantage of by more sophisticated traders? And what can we say about the volatility of liquidity conditions overall? And so just to, con to conclude, right? Liquidity is at the heart of well-functioning markets. And so the concern here is that we might be re rediscovering issues that are well-known in traditional finance, issues like bank run dynamics. Um, um, and I'm putting bank run in quotation because we're talking about dealers, but you can have similar dynamics where liquidity suddenly dries up, right? And um, in these situations in traditional finance, you have a, a lender of last resort or a central bank as a market maker of last resort. But in the with the blockchain, you don't you don't have the equivalent. So who is bailing out liquidity? Um, and are we about to discover some very unpleasant dynamics um, that that we know of in traditional finance with with this new model? Okay, I'm sorry I took a little bit longer than I should have, um, but I'm gonna pause right there and happy to discuss further. Thank you very much, Rafael. That was an exciting presentation. Ed Dotson, you are muted, Ed. Professor Chap, I'm 
I'm overwhelmed by the presentation you just gave us. I feel like a dinosaur. I've been out of the financial services sector since 2005. And even back in, in that day when my job was to generate business volume for Fannie Mae uh, every day, the people at our trading desk used to just describe me and what I did as overhead, that they were the people who were making the money for the company on a daily basis. And it seems this sophistication that you introduced is moving us even more in that direction, that the people that that did what I did for a living worked with lending institutions, worked with uh, consumers, uh, are marginalized by this whole process. Whether that's a good thing, a bad thing, I think we'll find out. My, my role is to bring this discussion uh, down a bit to a simpler level, I think, and also offer some historical perspective on how we got here from where we were historically. Um, I don't usually read a paper uh, when I participate in these discussions, but in the interest of time and to try to be succinct, I prepared a fairly short paper that I am going to read and hopefully it will uh, help uh, set the stage for our later discussion. Um, I simply asked the question in this paper, uh, cryptocurrencies, are they the future or just another scheme to take without giving? Um, and I begin this way. For much of human history, people lived in small tribal societies, producing very little surplus as hunter-gatherers. What individuals produced became part of the group's common assets, shared more or less equally. However, there were those members who developed specialized knowledge of natural occurrences mysterious to almost everyone else. These knowledge bearers affected a redistribution of wealth to themselves in return for the wisdom they obtained out of their demonstrated ability to communicate with the gods. As the centuries came and went, as societies began to settle in one place, egalitarian tribal structures gave way to hierarchy. And with hierarchy came an increasing pattern of wealth redistribution from producers to a rentier aristocracy and its religious counterpart. The societal structure required that the output of producers exceed what was required for their own subsistence. This encouraged specialization, and with specialization of production came the need for systems of exchange and record keeping. Producers brought their goods to market entered into contracts with one another, and reached agreement over what goods would serve as a medium of exchange. Fast forward to today, and what we have is a system of money and credit that in many ways would be familiar to the ancients. They eventually embraced precious metals as a universal medium of exchange. Governments minted coins out of these metals and declared them to be legal tender and an accepted form of payment of taxes, fines, and other fees. The Crusades then reopened trade with societies of the Eastern Mediterranean. Shipbuilding blossomed, as did a new age of exploration, financed by medieval and then Renaissance banking families. The Dutch created the first deposit bank in 1609, minting coinage of a standard metallic content out of deposits of precious metals and other coinage then in circulation. Depositors received a receipt for their money that could then be used in payment of goods or services. This experiment in full reserve banking lasted only until the banking officers began to issue banknotes that exceeded the bank's actual capital, that is, the fees charged to depositors for the services the bank performed. So-called fractional reserve banking was then adopted as the new standard with numerous periods during which governments halted the payment of gold to repatriate currency other governments did not want to hold in reserve. For some time now, the only control over the expansion of the money supply by central banks has been the fear of skyrocketing inflation. And the only effective tool available to central banks is the raising of interest rates in an effort to reduce the reliance on credit. A delicate balance is required to tame inflation without causing recession and widespread unemployment. Since the appearance of the first Bitcoin cryptocurrencies, the threat to existing systems of money creation and credit allocation have taken center stage. 
We're trying to understand the long-term usefulness and impact of a medium of exchange that is neither tangible nor has the status of legal tender. The very fact that the investment community has a strong interest in cryptocurrencies tells me that the exchange value of these currencies is driven by speculation and therefore vulnerable to cycles of boom and bust. They appeal to our instinctive rent-seeking behaviors, that is, to take without giving. Our historical experience suggests to me that the introduction of cryptocurrencies adds yet another reason to be concerned about systemic failure. In his 2021 book, 200 Years of American Financial Panics, Thomas B. P. Vartanian, a law professor with decades of experience in financial sector supervision, leaves his readers with this, quote, if one or more cryptocurrencies that are based on blockchain or similar peer-to-peer -peer applications were to reach critical mass among consumers as an everyday medium of exchange, and there was an event that caused a collapse and loss of confidence in them, the resulting panic could be unprecedented. Indeed, there is no assurance that the security of these technologies will be able to withstand an attack using the next gener generation of computing power. And I agree with him. I'm very fearful of what could come, whether or not this whole system of producing money uh, out of thin air using cryptocurrencies can be controlled. Uh, or whether it will be continued to be subject to the kind of concerns that have already been raised here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed, uh, for this uh, interesting perspective. Uh, now we are gonna open it to uh, the audience for Q&A. So please go ahead and raise your hand using the reaction button. Shock and awe. <laughs> uh, Yanis is. Go ahead, Yanis. Yes, I I have a question on the um on the verification on transactions. I think one of the advantages of blockchain technology is that the specific transaction can be verified instantaneously, or let's say near instantaneously, by all the participants in the market. In other words, everything is transparent. Can you, can, can you explain a little bit more how does that work and if that's how it works or not, or, or how it works, the verification of the, of the transactions? Who is your question addressed to? It sounds very technical to me. Maybe. Yes. So either I think either Gabby or Irke, like who are like more the computer science people, like if they, if they if they can answer that. Well, I'm happy to come in on that one. Thanks. Uh, I think I think the uh, consent, consensus isn't magic, right? So so uh, uh, consensus needs needs to be reached. The pra the practicality of of permissionless blockchains is that can the candidates. Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll give the floor to you quickly uh, so, soon, Gabi. That 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 candidate transactions live live in a space for a while until they get combined into a block, and and uh, uh, agreed. And that 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 time that time is as as has been been pointed out uh, already already getting unbearably long for some application areas. So I don't I don't think I don't think. Uh, I'm not. I'm not convinced that it's actually true that that uh, blockchains give give uh, blockchain based based systems give a faster consensus, a faster agreement between parties in any any sort of tangible ways. Uh, if anything, the opposite, because um, uh, in principle, the whole world needs to agree to a transaction, even if it's essentially bilateral. <laughs> right. Uh, so again, it depends on your system and uh, how you are actually defining 
who needs to approve which of the transactions. Certainly in private networks that are more sophisticated, okay, you could define uh, rules that say for certain kinds of transactions, just a subset of the network needs to validate them and so on. So there are validation rules and this can become very efficient. Now, in general, again, when you build distributed systems compared to centralized systems, there is some, you get more resiliency, but yes, you need to run a consensus. Consensus gives resiliency. It comes with some price of performance. But today, again, we can achieve extremely high throughputs, even with BFT, Byzantine Fault Tolerant algorithms, which again are resilient usually, or I would say typically up to a third of the nodes in the network to be malicious and still work correctly. So that's kind of the trade-off. But there are also technologies today, including we've developed, that we call them blockchain databases. These are, think about them as the same programming model as a database, only that you have all of the characteristics of blockchain non-repudiation, uh, the ledger, uh, unimmutable, and all of those characteristics, only that it runs in a centralized manner. It can still be distributed, okay, to achieve resiliency yet, but it's, and this use case sometimes is okay when you have a third party, uh, let's say a technology provider who you trust, and he would run for you that service. And the clients that work against that, the companies may not trust each other, and that's okay and the system will provide uh, high throughput. Great. Uh, Joe. Thanks very much uh, for your presentations, everybody. I really enjoyed them. And uh, it, as someone said, maybe it li it'll lead to more uh, because there's just so many elements. Um, uh, innovations like this sometimes have undreamed uh, applications and uh, one I've, I've seen is that um, uh, this kind of technology would be used by central banks and the banking system of a nation and their uh, legal tender it would it'd be used to make it, the payment system far more efficient far less inexpensive uh, far quicker um, and uh, it'd be a real advance uh, making the current system uh, work much better and cost us all the users much less money. More come, make the banks more oriented and the whole system more uh, competition oriented. Um, so my question is, uh, in the current system, um, reserves or settlement balances are not usable by uh, the, norm, the public. They're only usable by the, the banking system. And hence we have uh, enormous uh, sums of reserves uh, uh, on account in the Federal Reserve and they're paying um, massive interest on these. And um, that's a problem around the world. And the suggestion was that the uh, this technology could be used to create uh, digital cash. Reserves I, I gather can be converted to cash and um, this would make it possible to con uh, ex convert uh, reserves into digital cash. It's everybody could make it a retail uh, product rather than just exclusive to the banks. And um, I just, you know, it sounds pretty revolutionary. And um, perhaps uh, for the economist, uh, Raphael, uh, could you address uh, this possibility? Thank you. Yeah, that's a great comment. Um, and it, it seems we might be headed that way with central bank digital currencies. Um, the current system is hierarchical, right? So you have banks and they have access to reserves. And what we call money, which is our bank accounts, is just a bank liability to us, right? And it's not backed one-to-one -one by reserves. So the banking system has a, plays a role in the creation of money by directing credit. The minute a loan is, um, comes into being on the balance sheet of a bank, 
a new liability gets created to the person who just borrowed this new money into existence and it, it creates the money into existence, right? So if you remove um, this level of intermediation and you say, you know, just have reserves and now they're, they're digital currency and everyone has access to them and that's it, um, you have a system that's much less flexible to create money, right, um, when needed and direct credit in the economy. You've got, you, you've addressed, you've replaced banks because you don't need them for payment purposes anymore because it's so easy to pay someone, right, just to move the entry on the ledger and you're done. But you haven't removed the need for credit creation in the economy. And so that would still need to be provided somehow. So I would think there would still be a role for the banking system to play, even if central banks did implement mm -hmm. this digital currency. Um, yes, I mean, another thing to think about is um, with digital currencies is they're actually, it's quite fascinating to think of the possibility of being able to track in real time the movement of cash in society uh, which currently is a little bit harder to see, um, right? Cash circulates, but that's not necessarily tracked or at least, you know, physical cash. So um, yeah, that's a great, that's a great point. I think we're just at the beginning of this, but there's, there was recently um, an experiment, I think with JP Morgan, if I'm not mistaken, to try to move forward the digital dollar. And the fact that JP Morgan was involved makes me think that the banks are gonna stick around. <laughs> They're not gonna be displaced by this. I, I, I will comment on that, that we are in touch with multiple central banks. While in theory, it is true that they could provide wallets and provide direct access to the digital money. And if you look at their documents they produce, they say there are multiple models. But I think most of them, if not all of them, I've not seen even one of them really seriously considering taking out the commercial banks. All of them see the benefits and there are multiple benefits to that and, and to continue in this hierarchical uh, uh, model. I and have one general... comment. Uh, Professor Boynton pointed to one of the big issues and that is the amount of electricity that is required to make these systems operate. If if that can be solved, then perhaps the efficiency that was alluded to might exist. But but uh, with countries uh, creating these giant uh, you know uh, computer servers in order to uh, to to serve this block blockchain system, it seems like. Uh, we still have a long way to go before this becomes an economically efficient way to to uh, exchange goods and services. So, so that's not a problem in permission the private network. The consensus there is extremely efficient, like any other decentralized system. It happens certainly with Bitcoin, which works in proof of work still mode. Ethereum, by the way, which is a very large network and a lot of cryptocurrencies are there move to proof of stake, which is extremely much, much more efficient than it used to be. So they already made a significant change. Um, so for the discussion we had previously around central banks, they are all will be about uh, private networks. So that, that shouldn't be a concern. I think concern maybe, that- maybe, is, I'm, maybe I'm just overly concerned about my colleagues that are still working in the banking sector, still having a, jo a job to go to. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure they'll have. We are maybe in a process of considering to replacing some systems in, with other systems. And as, as uh, earlier said, provide services at a cheaper cost to the end users, maybe faster, uh, better privacy and better uh, anti-money laundry systems. Uh, but yeah more Good. accessible to more people. Good. Uh, Yanis, do you want to come back? We'll take uh, one more question from you before we close. Yes. Um, I want to say a little bit on the economics aspects. Uh, and to me, what's troubling is that 
cryptocurrencies are tied with fiat currencies. I would totally love cryptocurrencies as it would be an alternative medium through which people develop trust and create transactions independent and value independent of the central bank currency, which can be manipulated by, um, uh, you know, by, by, by a, a governmental oligarchy. But however, it doesn't look like, it looks like that um, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies work more like as, um, as a dollar denominated commodity or technology stocks. And do you think that's problematic? Does that compromise the original premise of cryptocurrencies? to provide an alternative currency to the current fiat? I can just say that, uh, Yanni, some of the cryptocurrencies, or actually many of them are unrelated to fiat currencies. So they certainly are behaving completely independent. It's true that in, at the end of the day, you need fiat currency, maybe initially when you want to buy those, in some cases or most cases but quite a few of them are being traded in without any relationship only it's the also, are uh, tied to currency to fiat could, currency. Uh, uh, could you name some or put them in the chat some of these currencies which are uh, unconnected to the um to the, uh... okay uh, bitcoin for an example mm. I think it's an important social question, maybe a political question as well, of whether or not um, they should ever have stati status as legal tender for use in payment of taxes, fines, and fees, uh, you know, assessed by government. I think that that's, to me, an extremely important issue. Mm -hmm.